Okay, so Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We are very, very privileged this morning to have um, Mayor Joe Robodeau, and uh, I've worked with him on other initiatives, so it's a pleasure to see him again. But uh, he is going to lead us in, the, in our next panel discussion, and he will introduce his panelists and keep us rolling. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, Scarlett. Thank you, Scarlett. I, uh, so the good news is I have a panel that knows more than I do, so I'll keep my comments brief, and, um, and then certainly uh, I want to leave time for, for questions. So, um, so let me say, just by way of background, for those of you that may not be from um, the Cadiana area, or uh, more specifically Lafayette, um, I, as a nerdy CPA, was paying attention to this early on in the process when the um, Trump administration included it in the in the Tax Act, and so um, we, we reached out early to the governor's office and specifically the Department of Economic Development, and I think Mandy Mitchell's uh, going to be part of the, the program later uh, this afternoon. They were instrumental in, in helping Lafayette and Acadiana secure what I think are um, really significant census tracts uh, that are ripe for development. and so. Uh, as it relates to uh, Lafayette Parish, you know, we started the conversations with our University Avenue corridor initiative, uh, knowing that if we wanted to revitalize that corridor, um, any help that we could get um, would certainly make sense and uh, ideally accelerate uh, our efforts. And so we started there. We ended up with seven uh, census tracts that got designated. And then if you look at the maps for um, uh, the Acadiana region, you'll see that up and down uh, Interstate 10 and I-49, and then what will be I-49 South, uh, that the majority of the census tracts that have been designated are at those intersections uh, heading east, west, north, and south. And so I believe, uh, building on what one of the previous speakers said, a lot of these uh, equity investors are going to be looking for uh, low risk with high return, uh, as everybody typically is. Um, and so we were very strategic in identifying the census tracts that we felt like would provide that. We felt like, were it not for a lack of funding, um, these areas would be redeveloped. And so um, I feel very strongly and confident that Lafayette and Acadiana has positioned itself with some really strategic census tracts that have now been included in the opportunity zones. Um, it is now just a, a function of each of us identifying projects within those zones. And so as much as anything else, uh, that's not going to come solely from government, what, what those projects need to be. It's not going to come solely from banking or the development community, but we all need to uh, really be thinking about where in this opportunity zone is the best opportunity, what projects uh, are there for us to promote, and, um, and with that, um, have a successful program that when we are ready for the second phase, uh, we'll have um, a lot of projects to present to Congress that, um, that reinforce their original intent that this was a good program and it needs to be not just continued but expanded. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. You can read the names for yourself there. We'll go in order. So um, Professor Laka, if you don't mind uh, getting us started, uh, give us a few words and then at the end we will open it up uh, for some questions for these guys. So Professor? Great, thank you. Mike is yours. And you may want to pull it a little close, not so much for the audience here but for the ones that are streaming, just to make sure that they get uh, some good audio. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All right, good. Good morning. Um, it's always great to be back in Lafayette. My, uh, my, the, the godmother to my child is, is from here, and she told me I've got to make sure I get a, a, a boudin king cake to take home to, to the wife and kids on the way home. So if you all see me leaving a little bit uh, before lunch, uh, that's where I'm going to get. Um, so... Uh, 
Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm a professor at Tulane University. I run the entrepreneurship program there. It's called the Albert LePage Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, I'm a professor of the practice, uh, and so what that means is that uh, they allow me to still practice, just like I guess a doctor would be practicing while also teaching. And so my practice is public-private partnerships, entrepreneurship, and, and supporting community development and small businesses. And so um, this is an area that's close to my heart. And um, I thought I'd lead with a little story, which is you've heard the Economic Innovation Group reference, that $6 trillion that they mentioned about the amount of money that um, in unrealized capital gains that could be eligible to benefit from this program. Well, I learned about this program not because I'm smart like your mayor here is who understands the importance of it, um, but because I, I had a friend who's a drinking buddy who was kind of behind the, uh, the program, so to speak. So Steve Glickman, I'm an FO uh, S, I'm a friend of Steve. Um, and uh, I can remember the moment. We went to, we went to NOLA uh, in New Orleans, you know that restaurant NOLA? Um, they've ruined it with the, with the bright lights and everything they put inside. And so we, we left that bar and we went down to Brennan's and had a drink. And Steve said, you're never gonna believe this, but that whole uh, opportunity zones thing that we were talking about earlier this year, it's gonna pass. And this was in like November. And I said, Steve, no, our Congress doesn't do anything. I don't know who you're talking about. This is not gonna happen. And this, this is way too smart too, because when you think about it, just from a macroeconomic perspective, this is the time to do that. We're on an 11 year bull run on our markets. And the amount of unrealized capital gains is $6.1 trillion. That 6.1 trillion could become, and actually I ran the numbers, it's, it's actually more like 6.97 trillion based on where the markets are right now. That, that 7 trillion could become 5 trillion or 4 trillion in unrealized capital gains if we had a recession. And so doesn't it make sense to put money back into the economy into places that haven't gotten that money and then to rebuild? And so, it's a really smart, uh, bipartisan, all the things that you would expect to not come out of DC actually came out of DC this time, <laughs> folks. And so um, I paid attention to this. I paid attention to it when the act was actually passed, um, all the way to today where I'm very um, impressed and proud of what's happening in Louisiana. Because part of the story I'm gonna tell you um, this morning just to kick the panel off is that um, other states are leading and there's real local leadership around this. And I would say that until today, it had not happened in this state. And now the Pelican State has woken up to the opportunity here. And so um, I want to congratulate uh, Lafayette, Acadiana, and frankly, the organizing team behind this conference. Because without y'all's leadership, I, um, I don't think that we would be in the position that we're going to need to be in to be ready to receive some of this outside investment. Also, make sure to tell your state legislators and the folks at LED and everybody else um, if you get ideas on how we can continue to improve this program because um, we've, got a, we've got a lot of work to do. So here's, here's the opportunity we're talking about. Uh, the National Council of State Housing Agencies, which was referenced earlier by Andrew and David, have found 63 qualified opportunity funds in their directory uh, that currently represents 16 billion in anticipated investment, fund sizes ranging from a million all the way up to $3 billion. Now, this is all um, money need to be raised. It's not necessarily it's already been raised. So let's keep that caveat in mind. Um, but the vast majority of these funds are focused on commercial real estate, multifamily residential, student housing, mixed use, hospitality, or traditional commercial development. Real estate has been the focus of this because the law and the, the guidance that's come out is mostly focused around what the new markets tax credit law had looked like before. And so even though the law itself is open to operating businesses and to real estate, real estate has really been where the first movers have been. Um, that's not surprising. Um, I've done some of my own research where I've gone through all of the SEC Reg Ds, and so this is anyone who commits to raise a fund, and I've searched for Opportunity Fund, Opportunity Zone, any of those. So this is just my own research I've done. There are um, 245 fund managers, that's 130 funds, um, with an estimated fund size in total exceeding $20 billion. And so this is the amount of money that's already being corralled, that's being announced to the SEC without even having the guidance finalized. That's a, that's a good, good chunk of money. Um, Secretary of Treasury estimated there'll be about $100 billion to flow through that program. That's a real low ball estimate if you look at the amount that's eligible for the program and the fact that $20 billion is already being circled to be able to go towards these zones. Um, but as the Economic Innovation Group recently wrote uh, in a blog that came out right, right before Christmas, um, quote, state and local leaders are responsible for devising the strategies that will take these few new lines of the tax code 
and turn them into something that unlocks opportunity for local residents and entrepreneurs. If you're going to remember one thing from my talk this morning, remember this. Capital alone is not a strategy. So the capital is going to flow, and it's going to flow to projects, and it's going to be based upon all sorts of different reasons for that capital flowing. But that capital alone is not a strategy. And what we're working towards here is, is actual strategy. We're taking projects, and we're taking all sorts of other um, government programs and cross-sector partnerships, and putting philanthropic dollars behind making some of this happen. That's where the strategy really starts to, to matter. And until today, I would argue that other regions were already ahead of Southeast Louisiana. So the mayor of Erie, Pennsylvania, worked with 35 local groups to prioritize project, and then he created a concierge service to make sure that those projects happen. He appointed someone in the government to cut the red tape to make sure those things got done. Birmingham's mayor secured more than twice as many OZs as any other city in Alabama, um, and he then put an online mapping tool right after they were announced so that everyone knew where they were. The mayors of Louisville, Oklahoma City, and South Bend have all unveiled OZ prospectuses um, similar to this one um, that they paid outside consultants to come in and do. Um, and then the city of Philadelphia has sent out an RFP to work on their zones. I would even say the city of Yonkers, New York, which or the county of Yonkers, New York, which has three zones, just three zones, had its own RFP to try and help make sure that people knew about their zones. So there are other communities that have really gotten out in front of this. Um, and two states that I really want to call out. Um, we've got a colleague here from Columbus, Ohio, so thank you for, for being here. Uh, I want to cite Ohio's leadership in this, which was House Bill 727. Uh, a representative proposed this legislation, which would propose a 10% tax credit for investors who invest at least $250,000 in an op Ohio Opportunity Zone. At present, neither the amount of investment nor the uh, total cap, total tax credit would be capped. So that's a big deal. That's an extra state incentive to encourage these national investors to come to your state. But then Maryland really um, blew the hinges off the door on the first of the year. So uh, uh, Governor Larry Hogan, and I should mention, I'm not mentioning partisanship, Republican, Democrat. Hogan happens to be a Republican. This is not a partisan thing anymore. This is about communities. It's about really mobilizing capital towards those communities. Thank God. We need something to be able to do that, right? And so Executive Order 1-1-2019 created the Maryland Opportunity Zone Leadership Task Force, which is being chaired by the Lieutenant Governor. Um, that includes a few benefits that would uh, be a part of what's called the Opportunities for More Opportunities for Marylanders Act, which extends a 10-year tax credit for each new job created by a company that locates or expands into a Maryland Opportunity Zone. 10-year tax credit per job. These companies are also eligible for an additional $6 million in tax credits. They have 100% of their state property taxes exempted, and they have all business recording, filing, or special fees waived. That's what leadership looks like to then take what's the federal incentive that the states will benefit from naturally, but then also be able to take things another step further to say, we want to be the best place for outside investment to come in. And so um, we've had a lot of uh, conversations about how Louisiana needs to catch up. As I mentioned, I think we're really starting to do that with your leadership today. Um, but the, the beauty of this is um, that our playing field uh, is really, looks really good. And so I made a joke. Uh, to the folks at GNO Inc. that it's uh, a bit like the Alabama defense just decided to fall asleep and Clemson decides to run through, but also the, the field is tilted this way in our behalf, right? And so um, if, if we can look at it in that regard, um, let's look at our zones. So we have the 24 that are, or 25 that are all cited in this prospectus, so spend some time and really get to know um, this on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, there are 150 zones across the state. 47 are in um, East Baton Rouge and Orleans Parish. And so that's really pretty impressive. And if you take where I drove this morning from uh, where I live in Broadmoor, New Orleans, up to where we are today, I drove through almost all of our zones. And so if we look at this as one large corridor that, frankly, any of these larger metropolitan areas would look at as just one region, and we think of ourselves as so far apart, um, then then you actually look at a picture that's really one of the best in the country, I would argue. And so let's, let's do some comparisons. If you take the 23 parishes of the southeast Louisiana region between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, that's 87 OZs, 2.6 million people. If you add in everything that's discussed here with the zones that are there, that's putting us well over 100 OZs just in that corridor. Okay, So basically where I drove in Orleans Parish up through uh, I-10 to get to here today. Um, 
let's compare that to some other regions. Uh, the 12 counties in Charlotte, so this is on Charlotte's metropolitan area and also the area in South Carolina that's sort of the bedroom communities for them, is 2.5 million people. So not that different in terms of population. They only have 46 OZs. So we have over 100 OZs from here all the way to New Orleans, and they have 46. The 13 counties in the Dallas-Fort Worth region, so that's 7.4 million people. That's all of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which, trust me, takes about two hours to, to tra transverse has 50 OZs. If you look at all of the Atlanta region, and um, like y'all, I'm proud to, uh, to tell Atlanta the only thing they're good for is for us going back there and winning the next Super Bowl when we have a chance to. <coughs> um, they have 5.9 million people and 65 OZs. So our map looks really, really promising. Like I said, the playing field for Louisiana has done this in terms of economic development. It's gonna take smart strategies to get that capital to flow towards us. Um, why does this matter? Um, I'll, I'll close out with this thought. Um, this is an incredible opportunity for our state. We have lots of lessons learned from everything from Katrina to the oil spills to the floods last year in Baton Rouge and here. And then when we look at that, that puts us in a unique position to be able to um, know what economic development is about, not just in terms of transactions, but in terms of transformation of regions. And so we should apply that, because now we can put ourselves on the national map for national capital. Because there are no caps and there's no congressional approval acquired on a year-by-year -year basis, this could be the largest federal program for economic development in our lifetimes. Many people think that it will be. They're, unlike new markets tax credit, credits, low-income housing credits, enterprise zones, there's no need for annual congressional approval. No reporting requirements, and this was, was mentioned with the gentleman earlier today. You just self-certify. And so it's a very easy program to get more capital to flow towards projects. I think that we can do more on the state level. I'm proud to see that we're doing more here on the local and regional level. And I think that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, um, I'm going to turn it over now. We'll, if you have questions, please jot them down. We're going to let all the panelists go through, and then we'll ask questions um, once everyone's completed. We'll move on now to Tim. Uh, Tim Fisher with the Council uh, of Development Finance Agencies. Tim, it's all yours. And Mr. Mayor, if you wouldn't mind, you need to see my slides here. So if you would switch seats with me here. Absolutely. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. So, first of all, I want to say I had the uh, pleasure of spending the last couple of days in Arnauville uh, nearby, and there's a great project out there for a French immersion campus. And just seeing the local community buy-in to try to move this project forward is incredible. And, and going hand in hand with that, seeing the Acadiana investment prospectus, it truly seems like you all have a great team working together to try to make sure economic development happens in the Acadiana region. And, you know, I just want to compliment all of you for it, you know, especially Chad right over there. Um, your work in this has been great. So anyway, diving into this a little bit. So uh, my name is Tim Fisher. I'm the manager of government affairs at the Council of Development Finance Agencies. And our organization <clears throat> has sort of been involved in this, this process since, I would say, early January, shortly after the tax bill passed uh, in 2018. And our role really was one of trying to educate states. Uh, most of our state agencies, or excuse me, most of our members are state agencies around the country. And a lot of them were the ones that were working with governors to help with the designation process. So understanding what the original intent of the legislation was, because there were certain components that didn't make it through uh, into the final, final bill, uh, we wanted to make sure that states understood the original intent. And that was that this is a, a program or an incentive designed to drive capital into distressed communities. It's not supposed to be a money grab, you know, for those with the, the large capital gains looking for a return. It's supposed to really push that capital into the places that need it. So we worked closely with the Economic Innovation Group, uh, Urban Institute, uh, the Kresge Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, to try to, you know, we held a meeting, a stakeholder meeting, uh, in March of last year uh, in D.C., trying to bring all of these state agencies together to understand the project, to get them think, or excuse me, get them to think intentionally about where they wanted to put their zones. You know, really focus in on those areas that needed it, and you know, alongside that, the, the zones that already had 
uh, some momentum moving forward so that the money wouldn't just go there and sit there. There would be an actual project already ready to happen. But so that's sort of our role in this. So with that, I'll, I'll move along here. Uh, actually, can you back up one slide here? <clears throat> so it's been mentioned already that there's 8,700 opportunity zones across the country. Uh, 150 of those are in Louisiana. Now, I know there's some question about where some of these zones ended up. Um, I think it'd be foolish to say that on occasion, I won't say in Louisiana, but that the politics play into where zones are located. I will say, given the very, very short turnaround where governors and their agencies had to make these designations off of all of the eligible census tracts, you're talking really about a three-month window they had to evaluate everything. Louisiana settled on 150. I don't remember, Chad, maybe you know what the, the total was initially that they had to sift through. It's, it's well, I mean, by definition, it's be four times that number, so. Yeah, exactly. It's like 300 plus. Yeah. So, yeah. exactly. So it's a lot of zones to consider. States like California had, you know, 3,000 some zones to examine in a very short time frame. So if some of those zones aren't quite where you think they should be, you know, there's been a lot of talk about a second round of this. There's no guarantee that happens because Congress is fickle. Having said that, there is a good chance, because this has a lot of bipartisan support, that if the program is deemed to be successful, that you might have another chance to you know, make the, the governor's office or your you know, Louisiana Economic Development Agency, make them aware of where some of these zones should have been last time and to try to you know, get the ball rolling for, for your own communities. But so, uh, moving along here. Uh, approximately 35 million people around the country live in Opportunity Zones. 56% uh, of those residents are minorities. Uh, 294 zones are in tribal lands, and 76% of those zones are in metro areas. So, uh, you can keep moving here. I've glossed through some of these. So we were talking about a map earlier. Uh, this is also from the Economic Innovation Group. Um, but their name has been mentioned a ton throughout this process. Go to their website, a lot of great information. I'll also plug CDFA's website, but they've got the really great visual graphics here. So uh, this you can just sort of see the, the spread around the country. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is CFA's membership and how it overlaps. So we really do have a vested interest in making sure that this program works uh, for communities around the country, just given where our members are. So if you move on to the next slide here. Uh, how many of you are coming to this Opportunity Zones conversation for the first time? Okay, a lot of you. So I imagine that even after the first panel getting your primer, there's still a lot of things you're not completely, you know, comfortable with or certain of. So I'll just kind of quickly run through as a rehash. So as was said, uh, opportunity funds can help tap into a, an estimated $6 trillion or potentially $7 trillion uh, market for unrealized capital gains. And the benefits for investors for investing in opportunity funds is you get to defer taxes on capital gains for the duration of your investment. After five years of an investment, you get a 10% reduction in that tax. After seven years, a 15% reduction. Investors can defer their capital gains till the earlier of the date the investment was sold or December 31st, 2026. And for investments held at least 10 years, any earnings realized by an opportunity fund will be uh, not subject to federal capital gains tax. The next slide here. Uh, Opportunity funds must make equity investments. This is not a debt tool. Now, it can function really well alongside other debt tools that communities, has. Uh, communities have, bonds, tax credits, tax increment financing. Uh, you'll hear about all of those a little bit later on today about how this can sort of overlap with those pre-existing tools. Uh, funds must invest at least 90% of their assets in qualified investments located in opportunity zones. Uh, funds must make equity investments. We already talked about that. And fund investors are currently seeking responsible exit solutions in order to realize uh, tax-free earnings after the 10-year period. Part of that concern uh, that everybody would sell off their assets at the conclusion of the program uh, has been mitigated by some of the proposed guidance that came out where you can still realize this 10-year this uh, appreciation or 10-year you know, return uh, up until 2046. So there's not necessarily a need or any real uh, reason for an investor or for a fund to just sell off their assets at the conclusion of this time period. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, fund assets can be invested in opportunity, excuse me, opportunity zone stock, opportunity zones partnership interests, opportunity zones business property. Uh, I imagine you all will go through that a little bit later today. I don't want to 
get into all the specifics on this, partially because that's not my, my area of expertise and I don't want to give you, you know, incorrect information here. So the proposed guidance that came out uh, was released in October of, or excuse me, October of last year. The public hearing was originally scheduled for uh, January 10th this year due to the government shutdown, had to be postponed, so it's been rescheduled for Valentine's Day, as was mentioned. So next slide here. So this is really where I, I want to get to and sort of uh, a quick overview of what's happening around the country. This uh, report we did here uh, is a little bit old now. Uh, we released it in August of last year. But it was based on uh, survey results we did from a lot of our members around the country to understand how state agencies were thinking about opportunity funds, or excuse me, opportunity zones, and what they were considering to try to support, you know, communities in their states and help, you know, drive investments to those areas. So we found that, you know, a lot of states were you know, already coordinating locally with their communities. Now, you'll see a lot of these, a lot of these graphics, and you probably can't make out some of the smaller uh, writing here, but the gray is unsure or other. So I, I can't remember exactly how many states uh, were in the midst of a gubernatorial race in 2018, but there were a lot of them. And as a result of that, a lot of state agencies had to simply just back off any forward progress they'd made until a new administration came in. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. So we'll just try to focus in on this blue and then the orange, which is a, a clear no. So are your states coordinating locally? Oh, and I should also mention this is based on 41 states. 46% uh, of states around the country were already working and coordinating locally. That includes hosting you know, meetings at a centralized location, state capital. Uh, Illinois has, has been working on sort of a road show of, of opportunity zones, stakeholder meetings around the state to make sure all the communities understand what's going on. CDFA has helped in this process. Uh, two weeks ago, we did a meeting with the governor's office, or see, a, an event with the governor's office in South Carolina. Prior to that, we were in Florida doing the same thing. Prior to that, we did a you know, big event at our national summit. So states are, and, and this is a good step for Louisiana, states are really trying to make sure that their communities understand the tool, because it is a very technical tool, and you need to understand it to be able to take advantage of the money that's out there. Um, the next you know, uh, question kind of follows that. Uh, does your state have dedicated staff working on Opportunity Zones? 55% uh, said yes, 15% uh, no. Uh, that 30% number that's unsure other has, are, has grown, or I should say it has, has uh, dropped since this survey uh, went out. A lot of states are, if it's not already in a pre-existing you know, agency, they're thinking of ways to sort of spin off and create maybe a, you know, a nonprofit of some sort that represents the state and is sort of that, uh, that go between between investors and the communities. So a lot of states are thinking creatively on this front. Uh, next, states uh, cre considering the creation of incentives. You know, it was mentioned Ohio. Uh, Ohio introduced legislation that would target investments uh, of over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Would add on, I think, a ten percent uh, tax credit uh, to those uh, investments that go to Ohio communities or Ohio zones. Uh, Missouri has also passed similar legislation, uh, tax incentive. Uh, they set aside, I believe, about 30% of their historic tax credits to be used uh, for opportunity zones, effectively. If it, if it met certain uh, qualifications, and they would add on or layer incentives to whatever project was happening. And the list goes on. A lot of states are, are thinking critically about this. Um, are states considering policies to support a pipeline of investable projects? 15% said no, but 33% said yes. And that 52% that's unsure other, I know has also fallen and mostly moved into the yes category. States are really, really active in trying to get, you know, reach out to investors, reach out to people <laughs> that are considering building in their state and helping them find the right areas. Next slide here. Uh, has your state considered creating its own opportunity fund? 33% uh, no, 18% uh, were actively considering it. Since this time, a lot of that has sort of fallen, uh, mostly because they realize it's impractical. It would be really difficult to try to act as a state fund um, to try to direct these, the, the money, mostly because of the time frame. Uh, there's a six-month window, and now there's a potentially a 31-month safe harbor for working capital on money coming into the fund. But there's a six-month window, realistically, that a fund has to deploy the money. 
So most of these funds need to have a project already in mind before that money goes in. So sort of like the idea of a, of a giant fund, a traditional fund as we would all think of one, fundraising and then putting that money wherever it makes sense, it's probably not going to happen. Um, there may be a couple of examples of that, but for the most part, they're going to be small single asset funds that have a project already in mind and the money is going to go right into it. So it's not really feasible for a state to do something like this. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not trying to help out in other ways. You know, like again, communicating with potential opportunity fund managers and investors. So next slide here. So along with what states are already doing, uh, the federal government is thinking of ways that they can also support this. The current administration has a vested interest in making sure that this program is, is successful because it's so very tightly tied to the tax bill that it was passed this past December. So they established this White House Opportunity and Re Revitalization Council. It's chaired by Secretary Ben Carson. HUD is taking the lead on this. They're looking for ways that they can target federal incentives and federal loans to opportunity zones that need it. That could very easily be taking an existing loan program, potentially something that the USDA offers or HUD, and saying, okay, well, this, this project right here is happening in an opportunity zone, so we, you know, we view this application more favorably. You know, here, is, here is some money to support this project. So those conversations are happening, and I expect as, as the year progresses, uh, we'll start to hear a little bit more about the solutions that they're, they're coming up with. Uh, the EPA, and I don't have it up here, the EPA is also really interested in this. It was mentioned earlier uh, about brownfields. So there's been a comment period, and it closed December 28th, but a comment period to submit uh, comments to uh, the IRS regarding the, the uh, proposed guidelines. And the EPA is trying to make sure uh, that uh, qualified opportunity zones that are in a brownfield, that there's less of a hurdle uh, for attracting investment. They, they want remediation costs, basically, to go and be a part of this uh, substantial improvement. So if something like that happens, uh, and if, if the IRS chooses to accept this as part of their formal regulations, that would be a big lift for communities that are trying to target those vacant areas that you know, they haven't been able to move um, you know, for really contamination reasons. So something to watch for. So the next slide here, uh, state and local engagement. You know, Maryland was already highlighted uh, the great work that they've been doing to try to support um, you know, zones around the state. One of the critical issues uh, that I've seen, it, it, at least as opportunity zones relate to previous place-based uh, investment programs or, or federal tools, is that a lot of those programs in the past, and I'll just use enterprise zones as an example, those programs, while they brought jobs to certain areas that were designated, those jobs didn't always benefit the people that lived there already because there was no emphasis on workforce, okay? So if these jobs are coming in and they're fairly technical in nature and you don't have the workforce for it, they're just gonna pull people from outside areas in to fill those jobs, sort of leaving the community itself behind. So one of the things that the state of Maryland has done is they set aside $3 million for workforce development to, to try to give communities a leg up so that this tool is actually benefiting them. Something I really encourage the state of Louisiana to think about doing. Uh, Alabama up here, uh, it's a nonprofit. I don't believe it's actually affiliated with the governor's office, but it is a nonprofit that was set up to act as a, an intermediary between uh, communities and their opportunities and investors from the outside. Uh, so it's really something that's essential here to try to make sure that communities in smaller, or I should say zones in smaller communities are able to connect with funds elsewhere so that the fund money doesn't just go to say New Orleans or, or Baton Rouge, that it can go to small towns like Arnoville. Um, next slide here. Uh, apologies too, I'm kind of rushing through this. I have a lot of material, but I see I have five minutes left. Uh, <laughs> the, the city of Erie was also highlighted. Uh, it's tough, I was talking to Chad yesterday about this. I, I'm coming here and most of the, the conversations I've had on this is trying to get communities to put together an investment perspective. You know, think of ways to market yourself. Highlight the assets that you already have, the incentives, the the project opportunities. Well, KDN has already done that. So, you know, huge congratulations to you all for putting that together. Um, the city of Erie's is a great template for other communities in the room that might be thinking about doing something just for your own area. Uh, also, Accelerator for America, it's a nonprofit. Um, it's, the advisory council consists of uh, Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA, 
uh, and a handful of other uh, fairly prominent mayors around the country, they've been working uh, with sort of um, a group of, of business, really stakeholders in this, this Opportunity Zones incentive to help communities craft uh, investment prospectuses. Uh, they've done one for, as was mentioned, the city of Louisville, city of South Bend, Stockton, California, uh, and on and on. So I, I would recommend visiting their, their website, Accelerator for America, and taking a look at some of the, their recommendations and, and what's been done elsewhere around the country to kind of generate your own ideas. Yes. Right here. So I want to close because I think this is the most important thing. And it was mentioned at the end of the last panel. Uh, everybody in this room needs to understand that just because you have a zone in your community, it doesn't mean that money is just going to come there, right? Not all of these zones were created equal. Uh, most of this information uh, that was used to make the selection for Opportunity Zones, the census tract information, is from several years back. It's not really current information. So there's a lot of zones that were designated that are already in the, in the process of, of, you know, sort of a turnaround. So that means that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there for those investors looking just for a quick buck. So if you have a zone that, you know, from your perspective, you can be honest with yourself, is not of obvious interest to a fund investor, do what you can to try to market that. You know, work with stakeholders in your communities to come up with additional incentives. Uh, help do whatever you can to, you know, boost the infrastructure in a certain area. If it, if your zone doesn't have access or doesn't have a broadband or anything like that, work with, with stakeholders and economic development agencies to invest in those, those infrastructure assets because it's essential for attracting that outside capital. This incentive as a whole is really a great opportunity to think holistically about your economic development plans. It should not be viewed as just a, a perfect fix that's going to solve all of your economic development pro uh, problems. It's just one tool in the toolbox, and I think that once you realize that, everything else will fall in line and you can start working you know, diligently to try to attract outside capital. So with that, I think my last slide, yeah, right there. Uh, if you're not a member of CDFA, join now. You know, <laughs> we got a lot of great information on our, our website and you guys can call me. Uh, you can call me anyway, but, and ask whatever questions you need. So with that, I'll pass, pass it along here. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I uh, I couldn't help but 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 think when when Tim mentioned that the states aren't aren't putting together a fund um, because of the the timeline and then how it's not really practical, and then piggybacking on what his last slide showed, I, I can't help but believe that there's going to be some funds that are established out there that are going to have a lot of equity and they're going to be desperately looking for projects to invest in just because they didn't maybe um, think uh, far enough ahead that 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 it wouldn't be quite as uh, easy as they thought it would be. So the opportunity for, for the Acadiana region is in what was said both earlier uh, on the earlier panel and again is identify your projects, figure out how to best market your project because there's going to be funds out there that are going to be looking to invest. And, and they're going to in some ways be a little desperate to invest uh, by my assessment. Um, once all of the, the, the specific projects are being done, uh, they're going to have accumulated money and they're going to need to invest it and they're going to be looking for projects. And so for those of us that are able to have our projects uh, as part of the discussion, uh, I just believe that, that we have the better chance of getting funded than a lot of the other areas across the country. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to come and talk to you about the real estate piece and, and, and his level of expertise. So Jesse, come on up, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions after Jesse finishes. Thank you. And thank you all for having me here. And I'll tell you, for anybody who's uh, not from Boston or L.A., Saints are the winners of the Super Bowl, <laughs> especially if you, <laughs> you sat down through that game. Absolutely. So I'm going to um, – well, Jesse Silverstein, I'm uh, from, from Denver, obviously not from here. Uh, I'm from Denver area. And uh, I am a, a business partner in an economics uh, consulting company called Development Research Partners. Uh, I have been working in the commercial real estate markets and capital markets for about 30 years. Um, not as a broker, but more as a, as a market reader, market whisperer, some people call me. Uh, 
I also love applying these skills to economic and community development and helping communities figure out strategies. Most of our clients are local governments. Um, and so I'm going to share with you some of my perspective, um, a different perspective. I'm not going to talk about opportunity zones. I'm going to talk about opportunity funds and more specifically the equity that's created and how you can use that equity to help yourselves and your community uh, take advantage of this. Um, so there's a, a, a promise of opportunity zones and I'm not really sure what the word promise means in this uh, perspective because Congress isn't promising us anything, developers aren't promising us anything, um, funders aren't promising us anything, but there's a promise of opportunity. It's right in the name and it's so overused in this whole program I can't believe it. But <laughs> and so I think the promise of opportunity zones from what I'm seeing is the ability to attract capital and um, attract that capital into previously overlooked areas for a large part of national investment, national investors, and perhaps opening the eyes of some of your local investors as well. And when I say investors, I tend to think about real estate developers. Um, I think what the uh, Opportunity Zones have done, it's, it's now created a set of funds that's looking for opportunity it's also looking for community opportunity, not just a, a rate of return, but also a, a social rate of return as well. And uh, the concept of social impacting has been around for about 10 or 12 or 15 years. And I've been watching it and I've been trying to put the no notion forward of real estate as a socially impactful investment. And this is really brought it to a head and has really brought it to its own and I think it will keep building that way. Um, not only an opportunity for investors and developers to find you and for funds to develop who now have a managed fund director who's looking for both investors and opportunities for you, but I think one of the most important things about all this, it's, it's given communities a reason to develop a community profile, economic development, outreach materials. Uh, to a reason to think about how their own local economic system works and how they can best take advantage of that, pull funds in for, uh, for great development. Um, and one of the things I think that is super important is uh, bringing patient capital to the market. Um, this is really important for perhaps slower paced economies, rural areas, things that are not Boston or LA or New Orleans. Um, oh, we're there. Good. And so I'm going to start talking. So I'm, I'm going to lay out to you from, in real estate terms what this investment looks like. What does it mean to a developer, to the development market? I'm going to start on the right side here because I mentioned patient capital. So when you talk about real estate, people put money in like any other investment. They get money out of it like any other investment. The difference with real estate in the, in the high level is you have two sources of return of that capital, two sources of payment. And that is from the added value that you do by building a, a building or renovating or adaptively reusing a property, um, as well as rental income, uh, net operating income over time. And so if you're a value added investor, you're looking at that build and flip, build and flip, build and flip. What's my, uh, my value added? The problem comes down to a lot of communities do not have a fast-paced economy that can support that kind of uh, value-added return. And really what you need is patient capital that can wait for that uh, added value plus the net operating income coming over time. And there are different types of developers out there, um, many who seek that longer-term hold, and many of those are more local, uh, local investors, local developers, regional, people who understand that patient money, and, and it's usually folks that want to do something good for the community that they're living in. Oh, you got ahead of me a little bit. Um, keep me going, are you? Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so the role of opportunity zones as I, as I see it, um, as was mentioned, it's just a layer in the capital stack. When you look at that equity, it's another investor, whether it's laid upon 
a multitude of investors uh, or uh, just two investors, one investor, it's a, it's a layer, um, all sorts of federal grants and state grants that can go into it. Um, it really addresses feasibility gaps. On the left side there, I'm looking at a typical real estate investment, 80% debt, right? That's where the banks can come in. That's what they do. They put down that, that debt piece, it's that equity piece. Particularly when you run into development, what I refer to as overburdens, brownfields and uh, utility challenges and, and things that are just um, over and above the cost of developing a, a, a greenfield site or a competitive site. Um, and what that does, that causes the whole pie to grow. So you may have had a pie where the developer's equity fills that 20% equity for the, for the deal structure, but then you run into all these other costs that all of a sudden grow the whole pie and all of a sudden what they have to put in is not there. It's a great project and it's a great place for additional equity to come in. Um, on the other side, on the right side, you know, perhaps as a banker you have, uh, there's there are higher risk properties, perhaps there's higher interest rates or not enough funding to go in. It's an opportunity to pull in that gap. It's an opportunity to pull in uh, higher credit investors. Um, you know, if, if you look down the list of, um, the multiple lists of funds that are out there, you know, there's Bob's funds, there's Jerry's funds, um, but there's also some pretty darn good credit uh, funds out there that can maybe enhance the overall investment in what you're doing. Um, so this was kind of mentioned, uh, there, there is no limit to how many investors can be in an opportunity zone deal. The opportunity fund equity that comes in is just one of the investors. No limit to how many other investors uh, there can be. There's no limit on the types of other kinds of public investment, whether it be uh, development incentives, fee waivers, uh, outright uh, city owns a piece of property that they donate, uh, contribute to that. Um, and while the opportunity fund itself has to invest 90% of its fund, there is absolutely no limit restriction on how much that fund uh, comprises the whole of the investment. So you could have 1% opportunity, opportunity investment in the entire deal, and perhaps that covers one small piece of what you need or covers the gap, uh, bridges it, uh, and again brings in those higher credit uh, uh, investors in. Um, so the opportunity zone trends, and I've got a few slides here on trends, and we've, mm, And so where, where are we now? You know, and, and I've been following opportunity zones from the, uh, from the real estate side. There's a lot of uh, large brokerage houses and small on the real estate side that are also following their uh, capital investors. You know, right now we're in the, uh, we talked about this a lot already, uh, the gimme sites in the high momentum market. You know, there were some opportunity zones created to kick things off, right? The easy wins that would probably go whether they had the opportunities in, opportunity zones or not, but it's a way to create ex excitement for the program. It's a way to iron out the kinks of the program using investors with a lot of capital to absorb some of those, those errors or whoops or learning curves for everybody else. So, so I think it's actually a good thing that we have all this starting off where it is. Um, some markets, uh, Arizona in particular, I've heard the property prices are actually getting little bits of premium prices. Uh, for locate properties that are well located and, and can draw in people investing for the tax benefits alone. Um, and what I hear from our real estate community too is where the fu funds are looking is at those places where there's already something happening. There's momentum in the market. Um, and that momentum could be as simple as, gosh, there's already been public investment in the market. There's already been private investment uh, pioneering development that's trying to revitalize things and this is a, a neighborhood in motion so it doesn't have to be necessarily um, a high-powered site it just needs to be a place in motion that has right we're talking about long-term investment so we're trying to pull in people who see a long-term benefit to being invested in this um, it's this program it's not a program I gotta excuse myself it's not a program but this tax benefit 
that's available uh, seems to be um, really tied to the private sector. The uh, government shutdown didn't seem to phase interest. Recessionary clouds that seem to be coming in and blowing away and coming back um, don't seem to be uh, waning, uh, causing any uh, waning of interest, and that's primarily because it's, people are more interested in not paying taxes now if we're, if we're coming into a recession or not. So I think it's drawing in a whole lot more capital into the program. Uh, a lot of property owners, I don't know how many of you know about 1301 exchanges, it's an it's a IRS tax program where you can take your investment, liquidate it, put it into another similar investment, and defer your taxes. The opportunity zones are so much more flexible because you don't have to put your entire principal in, you just have to put your capital gains in. So you still have principal left from selling of your existing property to put into the next property. So it's kind of a multiplier effect almost on investment. Um, and because the program is self-certifying, there does not necessarily need to be intermediaries involved. Um, you may not, you probably need CPAs. I think they're the heart of the whole program, actually, is figuring out how to, how to work on the tax side of things. Um, um, and what we're seeing in terms of investors themselves, uh, we're seeing a lot of high wealth individuals, uh, people that have personal property taxes that they want to want to address. Um, we're also seeing a lot of family investment offices, and if you don't know what a family office is, a family office is um, a uh, very wealthy family, uh, old school money, maybe new school, they basically hire a dedicated financial manager just for them, and that's called a family office, and this family office basically acts as the owner's rep and makes investments on their behalf. Um, the institutional investors, the people who invest in regional malls and giant office buildings that invest in the <coughs> best, best locations with the nicest properties um, and good solid credit, they're not interested in this really. Not, not yet, and I don't know if they ever will be, which is good. Let them, let them do their thing. Um, the high wealth individuals and family offices are much more engaged into the social impact investing. And that's why I think we're going to see more and more dollars coming towards communities of need, and that's why, that's why I see hope in the program. Um, and uh, Cushman and Wakefield, one, uh, a large national, international real estate company, um, I, I had attended one of their webinars recently, and they were talking about uh, how the Opportunity Zone program has such high visibility. It's really right in front of these high uh, individual, uh, wealthy individuals and families. And they are really looking at, uh, at trying to do good things for communities. In terms of the safe harbor uh, extension, 30 months, 31, um, yeah, I agree. What, how do we talk about substantial investment? How, how is that defined? Um, I was starting to answer before in terms of how much money have I put in against the project. Um, I've heard specific numbers, which I hadn't heard before, of, of specific 51% value added, which is a lot different, actually. Um, I think right now we're in a gray area, which um, a lot of people are afraid of opportunity zones because it is in a gray area. I think now's the time to get in there and do it and make your own rules. As long as you're not doing something that's <coughs> illegal, then nobody's going to come back on you and say, you've done something wrong. You're setting the precedent. Now's the time to go forward and do. Um, <coughs> Uh, we talked a little bit about the types of funds. I, I've kind of categorized them a little bit differently uh, in terms of the types of funds that are out there. A lot of the funds that we see are real estate investment trusts, just like you'd have a residential real estate investment trust, uh, uh, medical uh, specialties. There are real estate investment trusts that are looking for investments in opportunity zones. They may have specialties underneath them, but they are out there. They're setting themselves up as REITs, so it makes it very easy for individuals to invest. Um, uh, syndicated projects are, are basically uh, uh, investment, uh, investment banker pulls together a group of investors, uh, managers, uh, different principles and interests, different levels, waterfalls of investors for a single project. That's coming together too. Uh, CDFIs, as far as a community development uh, financing vehicle, they're being conduits as well. I don't know if you have a lot here. Um, one of uh, K 
came up earlier a uh, question about how you have to put these funds together. In, in, in my book, the way the law reads is uh, two or more parties in a real estate transaction can self-certify themselves as an opportunity fund. So you don't necessarily need an outside fund manager. All you need to do, and I've been working with some of my economic development clients about this too, is you know, if, if your particular situation is one that you can provide education to the developers interested in your communities and educate them on how to self-certify themselves, that's really clean, neat, and easy, and they're taking care of everything, and you got the investment. That's a very much a site-by-site -site, uh, prospect. Um, uh, other ways that a community might engage that I've seen talked about and, and, and done. Uh, sure, look, organizing your local high wealth individuals and families. Uh, I am always amazed when I go to communities around the country. Uh, it seems like a, a relatively poor, perhaps rural area. And then you go look at their community foundation. And there are uh, legacy investment from families that have been in the area for years that want to preserve or uh, ensure the, the future uh, existence of their, of their towns and want to make investments. I mean, that's a great way to, to corral local money together into that. Uh, regional coalitions, especially in the smaller towns, uh, I'm seeing that a lot where uh, uh, for, uh, several communities in the area might come together then be able to afford uh, a fund manager to either develop their own fund or somebody to represent them uh, or look at targeted fund relationships where maybe you have two or three preferred funders that seem to match with your community goals that you're working with. You're, you're kind of limited small pool of funders that you can um, compete against. Uh, so funny you mentioned South Bend. Um, what, what I did was I... Uh, brought along some examples of some prospectuses which I'm going to flip through really quickly. Um, and uh, the, the reason I, I pulled these out was um, because of the, the various kinds of approaches they're taking. Um, South Bend, Indiana, uh, we talked about. You just mentioned it too, Tim. Uh, Casper, Wyoming, Glenwood, Col uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and, and Gunnison, Colorado. So South Bend, anybody know what's in South Bend? Notre Dame. Notre University of Notre Dame. So <laughs> they're taking what I see, okay. and none of these are, are bad, they're just different approaches. They're not good, not bad, it's, it's whatever you're, you're doing there. You know, South Bend is, is taking an economic asset-based approach. We are Notre Dame. Uh, they have a Notre Dame investment uh, approach, and that's what they're keying off of. Come join us. Doesn't work for all places. Uh, Casper, Wyoming. They're kind of, um, uh, and this is where Andy and I are working together. We're helping them put together a, a, a prospectus for them, but I think more importantly, we're helping them to identify pathways forward, whether it be, uh, whether it be, oh, you're getting way ahead of me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, whether it be creating their own fund, joining a regional fund, uh, joining with other opportunity zones in the state to create a fund, or simply trying to educate. So finding that path forward, I think, uh, matters from place to place. So this is just excerpts because it's still a work in progress. Um, if you want to flip a slide there. Um, so this is interesting, purpose of the document. Uh, we kind of quickly flipped through uh, South Bend there because uh, I'm running short on time here. Uh, South Bend, with, when you read their purpose of their prospectus, it's to identify their assets, uh, to identify what, their, um, what it means to them. It's almost a self-teaching document, which is, which is great because I think communities need to understand themselves purpose of, of these investment documents and prospectuses, I believe, is to not only market your town, market your economy, market your, yourselves as you would market to a business, 
but to market to the real estate and capital communities as well. So right here, our purpose of our, of our work there, articulating the opportunities and risks of investing in Casper. Right, that's what a good prospectus does. It lays out opportunities, risks, all the funding, all the market information that you can have about a property, identifies specific projects, um, and looks at how the local community is stacking up their funds and public investments. Um, uh, we can go. You know, so we kind of laid out as as Lafayette has done here, and you guys have a have a great. I really love how that came out. It's really good. And, and I should say, and I, I know we talked a little bit before, um, a lot of these prospectuses are starting out just as marketing brochures. And as we get more and more and start to identify specific investments and assets, they're going to grow and grow and add to that. Um, so this is, this is Casper's zones, and they're fortunate to have four contiguous census tracts. I don't know if I would have ever used uh, the word fortunate. Um, have those zones, but uh, contiguous properties are great. Next slide. So, uh, yeah, why Casper? Uh, and this is Casper saying we've done our research. These are all the studies that we've done to inform you, the investor, as to what we have to bring. Uh, next. So they had two sites uh, that we're really focusing on right now, a hotel and conference site, center site, and what they call the Platte River Commons. And just as an example of the kinds of information, if you want to flip, um, that we're providing, prospectuses are nothing new. Investment prospectuses have been around a long time. So maybe a new context. So trying to really match up with what an investment prospectus looks like to an investor. Uh, so for real estate portfolios or properties, you, you provide sites and, and some visuals of what's there, what could be. Next slide. Um, again, we've provided a, a few more uh, uh, looks at, this, at the site. Next slide. Uh, we created a, a value proposition for that asset. Why is this asset a good investment? What is the value proposition for it? What's, what's it going to create for you? Um, and how you can partner with the city and how it's going to help the city. Next slide. Uh, we start providing some site information, basic site information, where it is. Uh, notice I've included the uh, neighborhood cycle, gentrifying. Remember, investors are looking for markets that are in motion. Gentrifying means that things are, happen are happening and going forward. Also means displaced people, but we're, not, we're on the investment side of this. Uh, next slide. Uh, we talked a um, little bit about the census tract itself. Some blanks there, trying to provide some information on the current land and improvement values so somebody can understand the basis that they're starting from. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at the neighborhood. Next slide. And then looking at the development program metrics. Let's tell us, investor, what are the rental rates? What are our, our construction costs? What is our occupancy rates? You know, what is the, uh, our estimated guess at what construction costs are? What, have, what has the city already put together in terms of putting public investment on the table with that? You know, that's how you grab people in. Um, next slide. Providing some comparables. Um, I actually changed the, the wording on this to be representative because these are not select. Uh, um, they really are representative of what's out there. They're looking to invite in a, a higher-end conference hotel, higher-end hotel period. So giving an idea of what's out there now, what the competition is, how they're performing, where they can go look, um, just to give people a, a context. Next slide. And uh, that's our second property. Um, but I think I'm over time here. Am I way over time? <laughs> so. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's your folder. All right. Um, I'm not sure we really have a whole lot of time for questions, but again, um, uh, I want to be respectful of the next panel. But if there, if someone does have a question for any of the panelists um, or any of the things that were, were talked about, 
I would suggest we're going to have a break uh, around a little bit before the lunchtime presentation. So uh, make sure that you um, that you grab these guys and, and get the information that you need. One of the things that popped into my head um, during the presentations was as it as it relates to an investor, and I hear self-certifying and, and and all of those magical words that that mean that there's nobody staring down and requiring you to report. But what does it mean for the investors if you put into one of these funds um, and the timeline doesn't quite work? Uh, what does that mean to your investment? And those those are the kinds of questions that I think uh, we'll we'll try to get answered as the day uh, goes on for for all of you, because that's a big component of it. If you're both thinking about establishing a fund, what does that mean for the folks that are investing in your fund? Or if you're thinking about um, investing in a fund, what does that mean for you and uh, what risk uh, is associated with um, slower than anticipated action? So uh, with that, Monique, I'll turn it back over to you guys uh, for the next panel. And uh, just know and I apologize that we're not going to have time for the questions, but, uh, but we want to keep the things moving and we have a lot of important folks that that have. So let's uh, give everyone a, a, a round of applause.